I don't know if you remember this commercial. It'll show my age. Uh, it's a, it was from Wolf Brand Chili. And the narrator asked the question, when was the last time you've had a hot steaming bowl of Wolf Brand Chili? And the answer was, that's too long. That's too long. Exactly. You, you feel me. Well, that's how I feel about the Texas legislative event. It's been too long since I participated. You need to know that to this day, I still love some whooper and chili, though. <laughs> I used to pack it up and carry it in my luggage from Texas back to New York with me, <laughs> at least every other trip. But now, praise God, there's a place in New Jersey where I can buy it, so I'm happy. But like Wolf Brand Chili, when I did attend the legislative event, I loved it. I was a first timer and, you know, I was teasing Stacy Hawkins here that I was wet behind the ears. Not really, but I want to think I was. <laughs> but what I enjoyed most was being with my sisters from across Texas, uh, United Women in Faith, and our passion for helping Texas be a better place to live by engaging in the legislative process on issues that are important to us. I remember feeling the power of being in numbers as we walked the halls of the Capitol and had our meetings. And secondly, this is probably a total violation of the Ten Commandments that we heard today. But I loved watching the legislator's staff squirm when we asked those tough questions or when we made it clear we knew what we were talking about and that we weren't just a bunch of ladies, you know, coming from here and there, but we knew what the issues were and what we brought to the table. Lastly, being part of uh, another part, important part, as you heard here today, was the part of follow-up meetings when I returned uh, to my community with my respective uh, legislators in their home office. Like you, especially the first time, as you may be a little nervous about tomorrow, I was, but I usually, I went with some other friends who went to their legislator's office first, and so I got my, my uh, courage up to go to my own and to have those meetings and to follow up and to be relentless to broaden their perspectives because they need to know that there are people out here who are very concerned about what is happening. So here we are in 2024 at the 37th Texas legislative event. We've had the plenaries, the workshops, the um, powerful messages and witness from Reverend Cheryl Smith and Reverend uh, Sharon Austin last night and yesterday. Can I get an amen for our sisters? Amen. amen. I love some, some clergy women, amen. So I'm gonna share just a bit of my own personal journey and encourage you to remain hopeful. And then we'll have a little bit of time at the end for some question and answers. So I will do my best with that, uh, as well as I'll be around for photos with anybody. Some of you have already grabbed me, but others of you, I'll be around if you uh, are interested in taking pictures together when we finish. Again, tomorrow is part of the event <clears throat> that I love, taking our call and witness to the halls and offices of the Capitol. I hope the office staff are ready. <clears throat> I venture to guess that they still might squirm a bit. I don't know, after all these years, they still may, but now by now, I hope they know who we are and that we mean business when we knock, or not knock on the doors, but when we come into those office spaces. Many of us, you know, in particular in this room, will remember more Texas policy making or attempts at policy changes than any of them ever know existed or were part of our concerns, you know. So it's important that we uh, offer them our perspective and our voices uh, to bring about the change. I can remember the days of Governors Ann, Ann Richards and Mark White. Y'all remember those days? <laughs> Before I engaged in advocacy and action, <clears throat> excuse me, 
My mother was appointed to two state boards by Governor Mark White when I was in college. And I had the pleasure occasionally, my mother never drove a day in her life, but she was at every school board, every city council meeting, everything that was happening in her community, in our community. But anyway, I had the honor of driving her down to, uh, to Austin for those meetings. Now, I could have cared less, I'll, I'll confess, that I was not interested in what she was doing. I just knew she was going to some meeting. I enjoyed the fact that I got to walk around Austin and be in her hotel room while she was working. <laughs> and um, the primary issues she advocated for were equal access to education, voting rights, indigent health care, and access to legal aid. Her work was not in vain, particularly the access to legal aid in East Texas. Do you remember the colorful buttons we used to wear that said bold, courageous, unreasonable? I was asked at my table tonight if, if my mother was a United Women in Faith member, and she was not. I did not grow up Methodist. Uh, I married into United Methodism and been here ever since, and it's... Uh, so much a part of who I am, and I get to live that out authentically in this community and in this church. But I think my mother was definitely, I used to think that she was unreasonable and even a troublemaker. You know, as a little kid, you don't understand. It's like she was always standing up, speaking her thoughts, telling folk what she thought. And I used to say, why does she have to do that all the time? <laughs> but... Um, but now I realize, in the words of John Lewis, that she was making good trouble and that that voice needed to be heard. And so for me, over these 30 plus years of hanging out with you, United Women in Faith members, I'm unreasonable too. Yeah. And I love making some good trouble, <laughs> especially especially when it impacts the lives of women, children, and youth unjustly. So I realize that I have become my mother. <laughs> but that's a good thing, you know, that's a good thing. And I just want to say to us, never underestimate the impact of how we model and how we live our lives makes a difference for others, and that it speaks volumes that we may never really know or hear about. But, um, you know, it may come through, you know, others watching us, especially those closest to us, our children, perhaps grandchildren, which I don't have yet. But, um, you know, church friends or United Women in Faith sisters far and near. You know, there were times, um, you know, with COVID that kind of cut out our coming together face to face. So I'm so grateful that this gathering is happening because we get to connect with each other across the state of Texas. You heard the, the lifting up of the conferences that are represented here and those of you that are online, you know, it makes a difference and we get to support each other. But folks will be watching when you go back home and when you're talking and when you're living out what, what you've been called to do while you've been here, it will make a difference. The difference between my mother and me is that often she had to be unreasonable, often experiencing discouragement, isolation, and exhaustion with limited support. She didn't have a sisterhood like I have, and that's a big, big difference. But she never gave up faith and hope. She understood that her commitment was not about her, but it was about the women, the children, and the people in her community, in her city, in her county, in her state, and in the, around the, the world. And so she stood firm on that, knowing that it wasn't just about that present day or the life that she lived and what she did, but it was about the fact that here I am, and I can be part of this connection now of being a difference and making a difference in the world. My mother, Dorothy Cleaver Lee, was a powerhouse, and I thank God that even to this day, her contributions in Tyler, Smith County, and Texas are not forgotten. Her legacy and name are still on the lips of many. She answered the question that we've been talking about from Mary Oliver, 
every day. Here you are, alive. Would you like to make a comment? Her response was always yes, to the very day she died. <laughs> and I pray to live every day of my life with the boldness and courage she had to speak up in truth and love, knowing that my purpose, like hers and each of you, is to leave the spaces and places we occupy better by saying yes. I have a comment to make today and every single day. The call to engage in advocacy and social justice work is a lifelong journey. Once that light, that fire sets off in your heart, it's hard to walk away from that conviction. Or at least I'll say and confess, it's hard for me. Sometimes, though, I do have to step back, take a pause, take a rest, refuel, before I can come back in and be, be as strong and know that it's not about me, but it's important to stay on the journey. The call, uh, once that light and fire goes off, I thank God for the victories. I think it was uh, B talking early about, you know, we have to celebrate those big and small victories, every opportunity. I can recall being in D.C. in March of 2010. I was there for an immigration rally. And we talked about, you heard uh, Reverend Sharon Austin talk about the United Methodist Building. We were there for being equipped to, you know, come back home, go, go in Congress and talk to our legislators, but also come back home and talk as well. And I can remember... <clears throat> It was on, I think it was a Monday night, but I just remember that the news, breaking news came and they announced that the Affordable Care Act had passed. Oh my gosh, that was a day, I mean, tears streaming down my face, excited that, thank God, it passed, which I never believed it would. But that also gave me hope that the immigration bill would pass soon. Well, well. <laughs> We're still waiting, still speaking up and hoping even today, not only for immigration, but for all the issues that we've been talking about while we're here. There are times when the possibilities and hope for new breakthroughs seem impossible. I'm here to say, do not give up. Do not give up. To not give up, especially our hope and our faith, and our trust to know that we can't always see how God is moving in our midst, but we have to believe, we have to trust, and we have to have hope that it's happening. And we have to stay on the path and the journey toward justice always. We have this sisterhood of faith and of hope and of love that many advocates and av activists don't have. And that's a gift. It's a gift because we can rely on one another. We can lift one another up when we get discouraged and uh, perhaps feeling overwhelmed. Uh, like Reverend Cheryl talked about Jeremiah last night. He's one of my favorite prophets. <clears throat> Not so much the weeping part, but I do weep sometimes. <laughs> I really do. But he writes in chapter 29... Uh, that's one of my favorite chapters of Jeremiah. And it, it really is a letter. Part of it is a letter to the folks that are in exile. And he's instructed by God to write this letter to the elders, the priests, the prophets, and the people in exile in Babylon to give them hope that God would deliver them. God's people, due to their disobedience, were in exile hoping for better days, and no doubt feeling overwhelmed. Sound like somebody we know? <laughs> Jeremiah 29, 4 through 6, instructs the exile community, immerse themselves where they are, to plant where they are bloom, to marry and have children, and, you know, multiply. We were talking at our table this afternoon <clears throat> about, you know, some people are, are in a place of, just feeling so disheartened with what's happening here in Texas and saying, well, we're just going to pick up and move because we don't want our children exposed to this or we don't want this or we don't believe in this. 
But you know what? We came to the resolution that the issues are the same anywhere and everywhere you go. You're going to face them. So like verse 7 says, uh, Jeremiah told the people to pray for the city in which you are in exile with. Pray for their welfare. Pray, pray for their good. And so we have to hunker down, do our praying, but we also have to act. And that's what we're representing here in this time together and what we'll represent tomorrow when we go to the Capitol. And then there was the warning, you know, from 7 to 10 about, as Reverend Cheryl said last night, not to listen to everybody, not to listen to the folks who are not telling the truth, the false prophets, and then there's uh, an affirmation that God understands their struggle and will deliver them from exile, but what? It's going to take 70 years before that happens. Can you imagine hearing that? 70 years? I'm like, my Lord, well, I'm 30 plus. Oh, what? Yeah, well, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm proud. I'm a, I'm a proud Medicare card carrier, so... <laughs> I, I'm proud to say I'm 65. Thanks be to God. <laughs> yeah, my sister and, a, and a, a friend, they were teasing me, a cousin, they were teasing me. Oh, you still a youngster. You still a youngster. And I whipped out my card. I said, no, ma'am, I'm full grown now. But anyway, <clears throat> you know, can we imagine 70 years? But sometimes it takes that long. I think about my mother and how she worked for health care for indigent people, and how it took many years after her death before that Affordable Act care was passed. And so, especially in this era of instant gratification, we want things to happen overnight. Doesn't work like that. And sometimes we might feel like the ones in exile as we advocate for years on issues, and we keep hoping, we keep praying, we keep marching, we keep crying, we keep asking God to intercede. So when I get discouraged, and because progress is slow and setbacks seem boundless, I hold to this verse in Jeremiah 29, 11, which I know is familiar to all of us. <laughs> for surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare, I like to say your shalom, your wholeness, your well-being, and not for harm, to give you a future with what? Hope. Amen. That's good news and a promise that we can hold on to in the darkest days and the struggles of our, our journeys. And I also like Psalm 4610 because it reminds me to sometimes just I got to be still and know that God is God and that God is working and doing things that I can't see, but I trust and believe because the word says that God is exalted among all the nations and in the earth, and that keeps me grounded. No matter how much and how fast I want things to change, I have to remember that not only can I have hope, but God is a God of justice. And in God's time, justice will prevail. And some of us have been blessed to see some of that justice prevailing in our lifetimes. And there are many days that are yet to come where God's justice will prevail. All of us may not see it all, but we can trust and believe and know that it will come to pass. We have to stay the course, doing our part, joining our voices, making our comments every day with new and serious responses to the injustices and the false prophets we see and hear. We must be truth tellers. We are equipped for this time, this day, this hour, this minute, this second. When we go to, to uh, the Capitol tomorrow, remember that, that this is our time and that God has called us to this space and this place and who needs to be here is here and that's you and that's me. So believe it, own it. And uh, I think it was Josh said, we are experts. Wish we had a button to say, we are experts. <laughs> but no, when we leave tomorrow, they'll know we are experts. So own it and believe it. We have to take those risks. I think about our foremothers a lot and the things that they took risks to do. You know, 
They took those risks not just for themselves and not just for women, children, and youth, but because they hoped that faithful women would continue carrying the baton of this organization for years to come. And so we represent that part of them. And then we have our call to do likewise for others. So I'm sure they hope that this creative supported fellowship would indeed impact the world. Since beginning the general secretary CEO position, I've had so many people, women and men, clergy and lay, come up to me and tell me their personal testimony about how this organization impacted their lives. And then in late November, I was at a global ministries of the United Methodist Church event, and I had the chance to greet the 400 plus attendees that were there. And I asked, before I sat down, I gave my greetings, but I asked, how many of you, how many of you, your lives have been touched by United Women in Faith or any of our predecessors? Do you know every hand in that room went up? It was spectacular. I wish I had my phone. I'm like, hold your hands up. <laughs> but anyway, I can share with you that it was a wonderful uh, and made me so proud of the work that we have done for 154, soon to be 155 years. So I want to pick up um, on the topic of engaging younger women for a little bit. Truly, we need other generations to engage with us for sure. And I've seen young women in this space with us. I'm sure there are some watching by Zoom. And we always want more, but we got to work harder. <laughs> but I just want to say that um, I'm encouraged and I believe that they will come. They will come. Come. We may not all see it in our lifetime, but they will, I'll say they will continue to come. How many of us, you know, I always say the gray hair you see on my head, I didn't have when I joined this organization. <laughs> We're here. They're here already, you know, and let's embrace them. But I want to say to you, because I've heard some of you say this, you have to be clear about what your intention is when you invite them. Some of you I've heard say, oh, we need them to come basically take our place. Mm -mm. That's a failed strategy. That's not what we need. <laughs> what we need is to hear what their interests are and how we can help them grow. How can we mentor them? How can we bring them alongside to learn and to engage just like somebody did for us? I mean, I think that's probably most of our testimonies. Somebody brought us alongside, invited us over and over again, perhaps. You know, don't take no one time. Figure out how to keep engaging with them. So that takes some listening to hearing what their self-interests are. We have enough tools and enough resources to make those connections. We did some research before we in the process of doing our rebranding, what we heard from every woman that participated in that survey, it didn't matter if she was part of the United Methodist Church, a member, or part of the church and not a member, if she was in some other denomination or not part of the church at all. What do you think the number one interest is for women? Their spiritual and soul care. Their spiritual and soul care. And Lord knows we have plenty of resources to offer to invite them into that uh, opportunity. Another thing we heard um, in our research was that, um, you know, that they want some flexibility and that they are ready to lead and that they want to uh, make a difference in the world. So we got something for that. The work you're doing here is making a difference in the world. So as we listen to what their interests are, then find those connecting points to do that invitation. And I think that we'll have better success with that. That's been my strategy, and it's worked so far. So if you want them I just to be a part and be here next year, I encourage you to begin by sharing your personal story. Why is this organization important to you? What's the impact? What's the difference it's made on your life? 
and why you are involved and how you think their lives would be enhanced and perhaps even transformed. Most importantly, ask, ask again and listen to their interest. Another thing our research showed us is that the age group most likely to engage with us is not always young. It's not particularly young women right now. And you think about, I think about when I was that young mother with two kids, two young kids, you know. I engaged only because I left my full-time job uh, to be home with my kids. So I had a little more flexibility, but not everybody has that opportunity. And so what we heard, or what our research showed us was that women 60 plus in the church and beyond are most likely who will immediately you can get some traction with. Think about it. They're retired. They're probably looking for something to do uh, to make an impact. And we've got something to offer them. So think about, and I always say age is relative. Some of you, God bless you, might think I'm, or before I told my age, might have thought I was a young woman. <laughs> so I always say age is relative. In my unit in Grand Prairie, when there was a unit, there isn't one now, but, you know, I was the youngest member there, and I was in my 50s. So, you know, it's all relative. But think about ways to open the, the opportunity to listen to what they want to uh, are interested in. And then when they come, let them lead. They have ideas, gifts, tools, more than we can even imagine of how to connect with folks and how to share our story and our legacy. So let us embrace them and then step over Still guide, but let them lead and trust their leadership. So now back to us. We are all still needed, no matter our age. We need to use what is in our hands to share what we have learned from our time at this legislative event. You've been given a multitude of tools. So somebody said there's no reason that you can't find your point and your place to connect and to do something, to leave here determined to do something. Do you know what our foremothers' tools were throughout our 154-year legacy? A pen and paper, an envelope and a stamp. <laughs> Eventually phones, well, they probably had telegrams back then. Eventually phones, meeting spaces, and by the 80s, computers. Now we have the World Wide Well. Got our sisters joining us in this space tonight by Zoom. Got tablets, smartphones. My phone's smarter than I am sometimes. Forget, <laughs> forget being smarter than a fifth grader. <laughs> am I smarter than that phone? <laughs> but um, you know what my mother's tools were? A rocking chair and a landline telephone. I watched that woman work that poll list, making phone calls before elections and talking to people. I was like, wow. I volunteered with a few of those campaigns, but I'm not sitting at home making those calls. So, But she and our foremothers strategized, organized, and mobilized for action using what's in their hands, and we must do the same. There are many resources, as I said, available to you through the United Women in Faith and Texas Impact's website, as well as this wonderful notebook of resources and guidance that you gave us. And if you haven't clicked the Join button on the United Women in Faith website to gain access to our member portal, please do, because that opens up the door for you to more up-to-date information. And it's like when we created the website, the member portal was delayed, so we had to go ahead and launch. But the intention of the uh, opening page was always for women who were not members, so that it was more informative. It wasn't too much over information to overwhelm them. And the portal is for us. But you have to have access to that. And so I encourage you to join. And my invitation to you is to write, before we leave this space, is to write the names of at least three people, men, women, friends, I don't care who you ask, <laughs> three people to join you in the charge before you, when you get home. Somebody talked about accountability and give yourself a deadline. I did tonight, when we went, uh, this evening, when we were asked, what are you gonna do? 
And I said, I'm going to start attending my school board meetings in my town. I looked on the website. I got the dates. I put the dates on there. When y'all see the little slip, you'll know that's me. <laughs> because we have to hold ourselves accountable to do it. I took a picture of it so I don't forget. I'm put it on my calendar just as soon as I can. But we have to be accountable to it. So I encourage you, give yourself a deadline. Three people that you're going to connect with to share what you have learned here, to encourage them to join you. You don't have to do it alone, especially if we got sisters at home, United Women in Faith members, say, I need you. We'll show up, whether we agree with you wholeheartedly or not, but we'll be there. So I encourage you to do that. Can you do that? Yes. Amen. So I want to end by just saying thank you to every United Women in Faith member in this room and on Zoom, because you make mission possible. And you do it on behalf of women, children, and youth. And that's our heart and our soul of who we are. You change lives. Your faith, your hope, your love in action really does make a difference. I appreciated B talking, putting the images up yesterday. That's how I say we put love in action. The fact that everybody in that room, when I asked, how did we impact your life? Raise their hand. There are people out there we'll never, ever meet and know, but we have to know that we haven't been around for 154 years for nothing, Amen. that we are doing the work that God has called us to do. And because of that, God will continue to guide us and lead us. And I know that growth is coming, so hold on and get ready. There's more work to be done. Y'all ready? Amen. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. God bless you. God bless you.